Welcome to the Green Wasp Removal YouTube channel. In today's episode, we'll be collecting a gall wasp nest from the wild and dissecting it in the lab with a microscope camera to reveal the microscopic larva of the Calaritis lanata wasp. This tiny wasp is in the Cynipidae family of gall wasps that form their nest in the leaf tissues of living oak trees through a very complex biochemical process that causes the tree itself to grow a perfect cocoon for the larva to live inside. That cocoon is called a gall, and you'll see that on many, many oak trees throughout North America. In this video, you'll see us dissect five different cells down to the larval chamber. We should note here that the gall wasp that forms this gall is tiny. The adult wasp that lays the egg that starts the process is only the size of a fruit fly, a gnat. So we'll begin here on August 15th of 22 in Northeast Indiana, we're looking at the underside of a leaf on a red oak tree. And on that tree, we found this orange colored gall, which is formed by the wasp called a Calaritis lanata. That's a gall wasp that only uses red oaks as its host tree. Therefore, it has a parasitic symbiotic relationship with the red oak. This particular type of gall has usually four to eight cells on it. This one that we're gonna dissect today has five cells on it. And in each little cell that's clustered around the central vein of this leaf, or the midrib on the leaf, each one of the cells has one larva in it. And the larva will eventually pupate in that cell over the coming year or two, sometimes three or four years. And when that pupation is over, the adult wasp chews its way out of that cell, and then it will lay eggs again on an oak tree and repeat the cycle. Most gall wasps are very host specific, which means they will only parasitize a certain type of plant. Oak trees are often the chosen target of many species of gall wasps. So you'll find on the red oaks, for example, this particular type of gall wasp that we're looking at today focuses only on the red oak. It doesn't work with any other tree or any other plant. It always goes for the red oak. We believe this gall to be formed by the Calaritis lanata wasp. But if there's any experts out there that disagree or have an alternate opinion, please let us know. We're always interested in hearing other opinions from people out there on YouTube. What you see here is a very fibrous little button-shaped gall that sits on the underside of the leaf. This type of gall will never be found on the top side of the leaf, only on the bottom side where it's protected from the rain and the elements a little bit in the shade. And these galls are formed initially when a female gall wasp decides to lay an egg, she'll insert her ovipositor, which is the tube basically through which the egg will pass from her body into the leaf tissue. She'll do this while the leaf is still just budding out, late winter, early spring. As the leaf grows, it provides nutrients to the gall and the gall gets larger and larger and the larva inside the gall grows and pupates and eventually becomes an adult wasp. What you see here is we're separating each cell of the gall from the primary vein or the midrib of the leaf where it's connected to a central point. Each of the cells connects in the same central point. You see the green point right in the middle of each one of these cells. That green material is where it connected to the leaf. And through that connection, there's nutrients given to the larva. The larva lives inside a tiny seed-like structure in the very center of these cells. And we'll get the microscope cam out here in a minute to show you what that looks like. The microscopic gall wasp larva inside each one of these cells lives on the fluid nutrients provided by the tree until they become adult wasps. Gall wasps are herbivores, which means they don't feed on anything but the tree itself. It's, it's all plant matter that they eat. They never feed on any other type of insects. Most wasps will feed on insect protein and they will bring that protein back to their larva and the larva will feed on the protein throughout their development. In the case of gall wasps, they feed on nothing. The adult wasps, as far as we know in research, do not eat at all. They only live about a week. They live just long enough to lay an egg in the plant tissue of the oak tree, and then they die. And the only stage of life where they actually do eat is the larva. And the larva will eat just the interior nutrients provided by the gall on the leaf of this tree. All the nutrients will flow through the midrib connection point that you see here in the red circle. Now we're going to show you what the inside of these cells look like when we separate them from the gall. We're going to use the microscope cam, which is the setup you see here. And we're going to use an X-Acto knife 
actually two of those X-Acto knives to separate the cells from the main structure of the gall. And we're going to look deep inside each cell and try to find the larva inside those cells. So here we're just separating two of the cells. All the fibrous material is just sort of a protective layer which insulates the interior from damage and, and keeps it insulated in the cold. It seems to be unrelated to the nutrition of the wasp. However, some of that is still under research. But the green material you see, that's where it was connected to the leaf. That was the central point of connection for all the cells, and they each have one of those little green points in the center where they were connected. Now what we're going to do is separate these two cells, and then we're going to remove the fibrous material from the first one, and we're going to take a look underneath that fibrous material until we find what looks like kind of a seed in the center of that. And what that actually is is the hard center cocoon-like structure that the larva lives inside. The center cocoon chamber, if you will, is very hard, like a woody seed type consistency. And if you push down on it with the X-Acto knife, as we did a couple of times, it'll just go scooting right out from underneath the blade with enough pressure rather than immediately break or crush. It's very tough. So over the next 60 seconds or so here, you're going to see us slowly pulling away the fibrous material so that we can reveal the larval cocoon, if you will, beneath the fiber material. The reason we hesitate to call it just a cocoon, like a straight cocoon that might be made by any other species of wasp, is because the material itself is not made by the wasp. All the material you see, the fiber material, the inner core, uh, the little chamber that it, the larva lives inside, all of that is made by the tree itself through the manipulation of the chemical, biochemical reaction that the tree has to the wasp egg. Really a fascinating process because this larva and its parent that had deposited the egg has somehow evolved to force the tree to do its bidding and build it a house. It's, it's really a pretty incredible process that is still under a great amount of research. A lot of it's really not understood very well yet. As we remove the green part of this material, you'll start to see the larval cocoon beneath the fiber material. This is where the wasp larva actually resides and grows and pupates into adulthood. At this point, the inner core here, the larval chamber, is still microscopic. Literally without a microscope camera, you would not see this on the ground. It's like a speck of dust. It's tiny. The points of the X-Acto knives are really very small and you can see how they compare in size to this larval chamber. Here we take a second to look at the green material that is the connective tissue that connects the gall to the midrib of the leaf. We just take a brief look at it just to see it up close. This material is not technically part of the chamber that the larva lives in but it is the material through which the nutrition from the plant reaches that larval chamber. Now here's the larval cocoon being exposed. As we cut away the fiber material, you'll see it's just a little round kernel type seed-like structure. And it's very hard, like a woody material, like a kernel of corn, a dried kernel of popcorn or something is what it feels like when you touch it. Maybe not quite as hard as popcorn, but it's very close. It's a hard material. You'll know when you find it because everything else leading up to it is very soft. On the outside of the kernel or the, the cocoon is kind of a soft, almost gelatinous material that we had to rub away from the kernel to get a better look at the chamber, the cocoon. And it's, it's unclear if this is nutritive material or protective material of some kind. Whatever it is, it covered the entire cocoon. So to save time here, we're just going to speed up this footage and show you what it looked like as we began to expose the cocoon. We were basically doing microsurgery on these galls. It was a little challenging not to destroy these as we were working with them. You can imagine how small this is when you're looking at the very sharp points of two X-Acto knives. And it was tough not to crush them or lose them or have them pop off the deck of the microscope cam and get lost. <laughs> we did this several times. 
and we only got two of them filmed properly because it was kind of like trying to juggle a, a chicken egg with two baseball bats. It was, it was challenging, but we finally worked it out. Here we finally get the first one separated from all the fibrous material. And there's still quite a bit of debris on the chamber itself, the larval cocoon, if you will. It's still covered with uh, quite a bit of material. And it was difficult to tell, really, at this point, if this was even going to be possible with the gear that we had to work with. Uh, but we kept at it. And once we got it free of all the material around it, the cocoon was quite clear and easy to see. The next step was to try to break open that cocoon to try to find a live larva or an egg. And we weren't sure quite what we were looking for at this point. We didn't know how far along the egg would be developed, if at all. We really had no clue. As you'll see here, we were trying to be as delicate as we could, and we were trying to break this thing open. But each time we pushed down on it with the tip of the X-Acto blades, it kept moving around. It was very tough to control that with the tools we had. So it took quite a bit of manipulating. Ultimately, we were able to open this one, and it just kept getting smaller and smaller. We'd peel one layer away, find another layer, peel that layer away, find another layer. Eventually, we got down to a tiny core that was the size of maybe a grain of sand. And when we got to that point, we tried to open it up a little bit, and it just crushed. We didn't find anything that looked like a larva. If it was in there, we didn't see it. But then again, the tools we're working with are not the best. It's not a very high-resolution microscope cam. So we eventually just scraped it down to the grain of sand type structure beneath and just crushed it, and that was it. We didn't find anything. You can see here we filmed everything we did find, and nothing seemed to strike us as a larva or an egg um, or any of that forming. This may have just been a failed cell. We're not sure. Uh, let us know what you think if you take a look here and you see anything uh, that you think in your experience might have been a viable larva. So what we did here was we just simply moved on to the next one. So here's the second cell of the five that we opened on this day from this one gall. And for this one we're going to put it on fast forward here so you can see the process of removing all the fiber and getting it all the way down to the inner core, which was the cocoon that the larva would have lived in. And we'll show that to you here now quickly. On this one, we got down to the core with no problem. And it was a nice, good, clear look at another cocoon structure beneath all the fiber. The problem was on this one, we had the microscope camera running on battery. And the battery died right before we opened it. So we moved on to cell number three. For the third cell here, we went ahead and plugged in the microscope cam and just ran it off an extension cord. That made it easier to work with without worrying about battery power. We're going to show you this one on fast forward as well. Like the second cell, this one went very smooth. We went all the way down to the point where we could see the inner core or the cocoon very clearly. It was easy to work with getting it down. But now uh, this one fell off the microscope deck and we lost it. And again, this is micro surgery on these things. It was like a grain of sand somewhere in the room, the office floor, in the lab. And it was impossible to find, so we moved on to the fourth one. We had better luck on the fourth one, so we're going to show you that in high speed right up to the point where we open up the cocoon itself, and then we'll go back to real time. Here we are back in real time. So we got down to the point where we could see this cocoon very clearly underneath all the fiber. We had scraped away all of the material on the outside of the cocoon, um, and now we were going to open it up. And this time we went a little slower, a little more carefully, since we had learned our lesson over losing a couple of them before. And we were able to open this chamber. And this time we did find what appears to be an egg. As we slice into it here, take a look very carefully on the left side of the slice. There you have what we believe is a good example of an egg of the gall wasp. Or maybe to put it more accurately, it, it could just be a very young larva. The egg itself may have hatched, and this is the beginning stages of a very small larva. We're not entirely sure. We're not gall wasp experts, but we are attempting to show you what we see as we see it. And there you have what appears to be a viable egg or larva. 
in trying to get a better look at it, we went ahead and continued to dissect the chamber or the cocoon to try to get further into it and separate the egg from it. And here we'll freeze the frame for a second just to give you a better look at it. At some point this will grow, this larva, to the point where it becomes able to tunnel through the entire gall. And as it becomes an adult form of the wasp, after the gall drops to the ground, evidently around October that would occur in this particular species, the adult wasp would then chew its way out of the gall and burrow underground at the base of the tree. And it would then find its way to the tree, crawl its way back up the tree, and eventually mate and lay an egg. The crazy thing about that is that it may take two or three years for the adult wasp to actually emerge from that particular cocoon. Sometimes they may happen in a season. In other words, if it drops from the tree in October, which is when this species typically falls off the leaf and lands on the ground, it may take a couple of months into the warm season when it emerges, or it may go two or three more years before it comes out. So a lot of researchers will collect these and put them into sealed containers when they fall to the ground, and they'll just sit with them and wait and they'll see if it happens in a year or a season or two years or three years. Eventually the adult wasp will sure enough come out of that gall cell and it will be an adult form wasp and it will be inside that container. So you can then not only identify the species but also identify exactly how long it took for it to come out. Some of the research indicated that the reason this occurs is that the larva goes into some type of diapause or a, or a waiting period until the conditions environmentally are exactly perfect to come out and that's when it will emerge. So that will depend seasonally on what's going on with the weather and what's going on environmentally in that ecosystem and evidently those factors combine to some perfect storm which allows this little larva to pupate and come out as an adult. So here we moved on to the fifth cell. This one probably gave us the best view of all of them, of the larva inside the cell. So we're going to go through the usual fast forward routine on this until we get to the point where the cocoon is exposed and then we'll go back to real time and let you watch that cocoon get opened up. Like the others, once the fiber was removed from this one, we had to remove a layer of that other material from the very outer edges of the cocoon. And once that was cleared, we were able to open it and take a look at the larva inside. And you'll notice that in this one, the larva was actually moving. So we were glad to be able to document a live larva. We'll freeze the frame here just for a sec so you can take a look at it. And then uh, we'll blow it up here a little bit too so you can see it actually moving. So it seems to be pulsating a little bit. It's a little hard to tell in the light. And then we knocked it by accident with the right side blade had to kind of fight it back into frame here as it got stuck to some of the cocoon material again. But you can still see it pretty well. So this field experiment was aimed at looking at the developmental stage of the larva here in August of 2022 when the galls on this particular red oak were looking pretty obvious and starting to be noticeable. This fall, when this species tends to start falling off the tree, when the galls start falling off the leaves landing on the ground, we'll try to do an update video for you to let you know what the difference looks like now in the larval development at that stage. We'll try to dissect another gall and see what's happening inside those. That should happen by the end of October, so hopefully we'll have another update video at that time for you. At that time, we'll also collect some of the fallen galls, and we will preserve them in containers so that we can then document what type of wasp comes out and when that occurs, whether it's going to be next summer or maybe two or three summers from now. For now, we'll close this video by taking a look at some of the cell fibers up close. The bulk of the gall is made out of this material, and you'll find that when you see it in the wild, you'll see kind of an orangish color button on the bottom of red oak leaves. And if you see that, then you know you're looking at one of these most likely. And this is what they look like up close. The fibers are really interesting. And you can see where the orange color comes from on the outer edges of these fibers. They're more white toward the interior. 
but they're more orange on the outside. It's a really interesting material. And within these shots, we saw some really tiny little mites crawling around, little translucent mites. And we saw eggs, that what looked like egg cells, like other insects have been utilizing this material for their own use, evidently. So these galls really create their own micro-ecosystems within a grand-scale ecosystem. And that's not uncommon from an evolutionary biology standpoint, is that they provide a great amount of sustenance to a huge range of insects like ants and wasps and other insects who come and lap up some of the sap that oozes out of these galls. And they also provide food for parasites that will prey on the larva on the inside of the gall. And they will also provide food for mammals, birds, all sorts of things that will eat these galls and survive because of that. So researchers are still just finding out now how important galls can be to the ecosystem. The more they study these things, the more they find out how important they can be. For example, even some of the galls that are vacated by the gall wasp become the home for a whole new collection of insects who use the empty galls for their own shelter, for raising their own eggs and larvae. So it's an ongoing cycle of biodiversity gains. We'll close out here with a little bit of footage of the connection point where the gall meets the leaf. The red material you see underneath the last of the fiber here is the direct connection points. And that tissue is interesting to look at. It has a lot of the similar oranges and reds in it that some of the fiber did. But if you look at the primary vein or the midrib itself, we'll dissect that a little bit here in a second, you'll see that despite the gall completely surrounding that primary vein, it doesn't damage the vein or cut it off in any way because it depends on it. All the nutrients that flow through the tissues of the gall itself come from that primary vein or that midrib. So the gall taps into this midrib like an oil pipeline, but it doesn't disrupt it. It's very interesting how the biology of this thing has developed. At the cellular level of this plant, this oak tree, this leaf, there's a complete connection, intricately interwoven cell by cell, yet there's no real damage done to the leaf itself. The leaf is still functional. The tree is still functional. Nothing is killed here. Despite technically a parasitic relationship between the gall wasp and the oak tree, even if you look underneath inside of the main primary vein or midrib, there just doesn't appear to be any damage at all to the actual functionality of that midrib. The tissue looks perfectly healthy even in the midst of being completely encased in the material that feeds the gall. So gall wasps are quite fascinating, and the way they interact with living plants and trees. There's tons of different species, and most of them are host-specific, so they only form galls on very specific trees or very specific plants. And in general, galls are not just from gall wasps. They're from all sorts of different insect life. So that's it for today's video. Thanks for being with us. We'll try to update this one uh, as we get more galls in the later part of the year and into next summer. Let us know in the comments if you see any of these out there. We'll see you next time. Have a good one. <music>